Well, uh, as uh, Laurent already uh, explained, in the CantoStream project, we study uh, big data history of music, a term that we borrowed from Stephen and Sandra, uh, focusing on the uh, 16th and 17th century um, period in particular, and my personal interest is in tonal structures there, but we look a little bit further than that. So overall, we want to, um, yeah, oh, that's two slides. Um, what's, the, what's happening here? Okay, that's, that's, that's the right slide, yes. Sorry, it looks different here than on my printout. So, in the constant project, we want to find patterns in musical audio, in encodings, and in metadata. And with the use of the patterns we find, we would like to extend and modify historical narratives. We aren't there yet, but we're working on it. And one of the things we want to do is to explore the potential of the RISM data for such uh, research. And that's also based or inspired by articles that uh, Jennifer and Klaus Kyle have written about the potential of the data. And today we will discuss two case studies. Uh, one is on modal cycles, I will be explaining that. And the other is on uh, opera performances. Um, just a few words about the technical approach first. Uh, we have downloaded the uh, RISM data uh, in Mark XML and worked with that, so we are not yet using the, uh, the API, that's the next step. And we've done a lot of Python programming to enable this. This is the only piece of code we will demonstrate straight to you today, but this is a serious part of our program. Now, um, my job is then to explain uh, the, the case of the modal cycles. What is a modal cycle? A modal cycle is a set of compositions through all the modes, typically eight or 12 modes, though other numbers are also being used. Uh, they're important because they constitute robust evidence for the practical reality of polyphonic modality in the 16th to 18th century. And here are also some better known composers of modal cycles. Orlando de Lasso uh, contributed many of them, Palestrina several, Frescobaldi, I think around three, uh, Samuel Scheidt one, and Denis Gauthier, of course, the La Rhetorique des Dieux, which is a 12 mode cycle with some quirks. Um, so uh, important composers wrote modal cycles, but how many modal cycles are there in total? I investigated that for my PhD research, and by that time I found 475 modal cycles, that's including cycles, polyphonic cycles, through the psalm tones or psalm tone keys. And since then, around uh, 20 to 30 more have come to light. Now, my question is, can we find at, as yet untraced modal cycles in the RISM data? And untraced means not traced by me. Other people may have found it, of course. Um, for that, we need, first of all, to look into how modes are encoded in uh, the RISM data. And actually, we find them in two different fields, namely uh, 31R, which is the key field of the individual in chipits, and in uh, 240R, which is the key field of the record. And you can see here that uh, what we did is we made a list of all the values that occurred in those fields and just counted how often they occurred. And that's the raw output that you see a tiny fragment of above here. So, for example, the first one, uh, what is it, uh, 10T tells us that, 10, uh, that, that 73 pieces were found in uh, mode 10. That's a regular mode. But we also find transposed modes like uh, 11TT49 uh, cases, Byzantine modes. But it becomes more complicated uh, if we look at uh, multiple modes occurring in the field uh, or mixtures of modes and keys. And all of that has to be separated out for further analysis. Now, the 24R field is even more complex than that. Uh, well, for example, we saw cases where also the name is spelled out, like Doris, uh, Dorish, I suppose it's, that is in German here, uh, ranges of modes, uh, lists of modes, etc. So all of that needed to be cleaned up, and that was quite some work. But we did it, and we ended up with uh, 19,000 uh, separate modal or different modal assignments in those fields. As I said, a lot of tricky pre-processing was needed for that, and we had to rigorously weed out the duplicates here. Um, a lot of disclaimers, um, modes may still be hidden in other fields, for example in title fields. Uh, the distribution uh, over countries is very unbalanced and you can't see that, but we have 10,000 uh, uh, modal assignations from Germany and then uh, or nearly 3,000 from Switzerland and from there it goes down. <laughs> um, 
Also, what you can see from the, from the other graph is that the distribution over the different modes, 1 to 12, is very unequal. Actually, one-sixth of all the modal assignations are mode 1 pieces from Germany. Um, so it's unbalanced. There might be uh, some bias in there, and we definitely know that sometimes modes were routinely assigned to pieces during the uh, data entry project, and nearly always those are authentic modes and almost never uh, plagal modes. So there is definitely bias in data. Nevertheless, we can do things with them. Um, so after pre-processing, uh, the data looks like this. So we have the RISM ID, we have the mode, we have the compose, we have the title, we have also the holding and a number of other fields that we don't show here. And it's really easy to spot the modal cycle here, which is actually a Magnificat cycle by Johann Kaspar, Ferdinand, uh, Johann Kaspar Karel, uh, surviving in a US source that I don't recognize, but others will, of course, do that for me. Uh, now, how do we know this is a modal cycle? First of all, because the modes go up from one to eight. So we have to look into that if we computationally want to extract more cycles. Another important characteristic is that also the RISM ideas go up uh, step by step. And finally, a modal cycle must be in one holding. So three, these three things are the essential conditions for uh, a modal uh, cycle to, be, uh, to, to, to exist. Uh, on top of that, we have certain parameters that we want to be able to adjust. So the minimum number of modes occurring in a cycle, we know there are lots of incomplete modal cycles that, for example, drop mode three or four, or maybe cycles that don't go through all the modes, but only part, for example, one to four or five to eight. And we have to take that into account in, uh, in analyzing uh, the data. Um, when we applied very, very strict criteria, that's uh, 12, uh, minimal 12 modes and 12 different pieces, then we find these here, uh, that's uh, nine items, and uh, two of them are indicated in red, that is Della Chaya and Clem. Those are the ones that I didn't know. Interestingly, Della Chaya occurs three times here. And um, so Clem, actually, I followed that one up, is not one cycle of, uh, one modal cycle, it's actually three modal cycles, it appears. It's edited in, uh, by, by AR editions. Three modal cycles of, uh, of fugues. And the Lachaya is actually uh, uh, also an interesting case for another reason. First of all, the three manuscripts uh, versions are copied from a print. You can see it here as it is in Gallica. There are short didactic works, so the top image shows you uh, mode one and mode two. But interestingly, there is a bonus if you inspect the source. There is also a cycle of richer cars in mixed modes that I could not uh, extract directly from the data, but found by inspecting the source. So lots of stuff uh, comes up that uh, I didn't know yet. Now, what does that mean in quantitative terms? In other words, how do we evaluate this? Uh, well, the procedure I used for evaluation was to, uh, to apply the most permissive setting, so a minimum mode count of four, a minimum cycle range of four, and then I checked all the cycles with a named composer, and that were 252. The 87 anonymous cycles that I found, I did not check because it's just too much work to, uh, to try to identify uh, those anonymous works or to compare them to uh, maybe named ones in the list I already have, so I had to skip those, but that's for later. Now, I wanted to know how many of them are credible cycles and how many of them are new. On the right, you see the, the counts. So 110 cycles were already known. Uh, 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 56 ones are new, strong candidates, and uh, 20 are duplicates of those, and 12 weak candidates, and uh, 54 of them are not uh, cycles. So in total, we find uh, uh, 186 credible cycles from, uh, from the data, of which uh, 56 are new, and then plus the 12 uh, weak ones that uh, need further analysis. Uh, so what we could show is that it was, we, we could successfully extract uh, or work with a concept that's not encoded in the data yet and find useful results, uh, also from a musicological point of view. And that's really nice. And, um, Last uh, example I want to show is a, a probably not so boring Polish stuff to cite my neighbor here. Um, it's a piece that was found as, a ma as, as masses in D minor, and uh, it's, uh, it's this one. It's called masses in D minor, and if you look at the insipids, you can see that uh, the uh, modes are one, four, six, nine, 10, 11, and 12. 
Uh, however, if you inspect it more closely, you can see that the title is a Missa Omnium Tonorum Pro Electione Regis Poloniae Casimiri. Um, so it is a mass composed in the form of a modal cycle, and the cycle was only incompletely uh, encoded in the, in the rhythm data. And to prove that, you can see the bit that's in the fifth tone from, uh, from, uh, from one of the manuscripts, which is in Berlin. Uh, so uh, actually a complete modal cycle that uh, I particularly like, even though I have heard only the Kyrie performed of this. Um, and I want to hand over to Mirjam for the second case study. Thank you. The second case study. I already promised you some pictures, and here they will finally come. Um, well, there was a special competition uh, between graph drawing specialists. They do, don't know anything about music except maybe for their incidental piano lessons uh, and uh, weekly choir. Uh, but they are graph drawing experts. And this year's topic was special uh, because it <coughs> contained rhythm data. The contestants were provided with uh, data about opera performances uh, drawn for, from rhythm. Uh, Franz did the conversion from the Mark XML to the, to the CSV and provided them with the data. Um, yeah, we also provided them with a uh, couple of initial questions to answer. And that's how were the operas transmitted all over Europe, because they are graph drawing and network uh, uh, visualization experts, so they are able to draw nice networks. You will see in a minute. And also, uh, we wanted to, uh, them to show us the uh, collaboration patterns between uh, libertists and composers. So. Let's have a look at the data and uh, what it looked like. Uh, at the top, of course, you see uh, a screenshot of uh, Rizm Cozy uh, van uh, Toeten. And in yellow, uh, there, there is the, uh, um, there's the, uh, uh, there's the performance data. And as you can see, it's converted into a table. Uh, uh, with composer, the libertist, the title, and then the performance year and the place name. And especially the performance year and the place name, it corresponds to the yellow, uh, to the yellow parts of this slide. Then let's have a look at the contribution of the University of Tübingen. Uh, the first thing uh, you see, it's actually a circular opera stage. Similar to the Römisches Theater here. Um, but that's just the visual theme. Uh, I will use the words to guide you through this visualization. Um, in uh, the triangles, in uh, black and gray, are the composers. You will see them. It's uh, Paisiello, uh, Meyer, Anfossi, etc. And then you see lots of colored dots. Uh, Each colored dot, each big colored dot, is a performance, one individual performance. Um, and it has a, sp uh, it has a distance uh, uh, relative to the central stage of the uh, opera stage. And the further the dot is from the central stage, the later the year in which the performance took place. As you al also can see on the left axis, left of the central stage. Uh, the colors correspond to the countries, and these contestants didn't realize that the countries, well, the country borders actually changed during history, especially the Polish ones. Um, uh, but you can see the, uh, well, the, the, the spread of the operas all over Europe. And for some composers, they were much more local than others. Um, At the right bottom, you see n is 200. That's the sample size of the opera performance, because all opera performances uh, uh, Franz was able to extract from the rhythm data uh, were more than 9,000. And we provided the, uh, the contestants with only 200 opera performances. Um, 
and also a bit related to each other. So same composer and uh, a circle of libertists. So it was a nice case study also for the network uh, analysis. And the network analysis you see in the middle on the center stage, that's um, uh, names in the bottom. Are you able to read them? No, you are not. Oh, wow, that's such a pity. Okay, there, there's an invitation right after this talk. Um, uh, you have to believe me, those are the libertists. <laughs> and the lines to the uh, different composers represent the uh, collaborations uh, with, the com uh, with the libertists. And in the interactive map, it's much more visible because if you hover over with your mouse, you see, uh, you can select them. The next visualization uh, has a focus on logistics. What you see here is a map of Europe without borders, so it's historically uh, way more correct, except for some Dutch land expansions, but who cares? <laughs> Um, the big circles are cities, cities where opera performances took place. Uh, each city has a ring, and each ring is one singular opera performance. Uh, the composers are color code, coded, and Mozart happens to be Irish Green. Uh, here, also with the hoof over with the mouse, uh, I made a screenshot of Mozart Don Giovanni. And as you can see here, and I also have it much more close up, Dresden. Um, the Mozart Don Giovanni, it started in Prague, and then you see lines between the cities, which means the successive uh, year of opera performances. Uh, one back, you can see the, well, the virtual route the opera took all over Europe. But it's not a real representation of the distribution of operas or opera uh, well, performance groups, or they were not a circus. So the, uh, the logistics were way more complex than this uh, visual visualization reflects. And this is all made by professionals, seasoned in craft drawing and network visualization. I don't think anyone in this room is able to uh, replicate this. Uh, I am, for sure, I am not. But let's have a look at a uh, much more accessible level. And that's uh, one of our students. It's a bachelor student. Uh, she uh, researched the geographical spread of regular versus irregular meters across Europe. And... Um, she also did an, uh, 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 she used the CSV uh, file also provided by France and she, uh, she put it in Tableau after cleaning the data and standardizing especially the meters and the geographical um, uh, locations. Um, which brings me to the data quality aspect. Yesterday we had a talk about it uh, during coffee. And I decided to uh, share with you two examples. Uh, one is, um, uh, it's field uh, 518. Uh, so that's with place names and other locations. And um, as you can see, there is a huge difference in spelling and also typos uh, for the ge geographical uh, uh, work. And then the meters. Uh, so it's the right table, you see the meter uh, as coded in field 31 and then the count, so the amount of meters. I coded them myself, uh, so how ambiguous are they? The yellow ones are a bit ambiguous, but we can deduct C, I think it's 4 slash 4, and C slash it means 2 slash 2. I think that's logical. Uh, but then we have the red ones, and they are, are so hard. I couldn't explain my student how to, um, uh, uh, how to recode them, so she just ditched them from the, from the data. So therefore, also the map she made, this one, it's not really representative because of the ambiguous data. So that, that's very risky. And then... Uh, 
to finish, I want to share with you the lessons we learned uh, during these uh, case studies. And the first one, well, it's actually, it was an eye-opener for me that the rhythm data is so well suited to explore the musical wor world for especially the modal cycles. It was very surprising. Uh, I was in my office and Franz in the office next to me. And each time he discovered a new modal cycle, he came in <laughs> and he said, yes, <laughs> look what I have discovered. Look how much fun this is. And then, then we uh, started to listen it on Spotify. <laughs> so that's fun. <laughs> and then also um, there's some caution needed. Um, as you may all know uh, the rhythm data skewed towards certain countries. Uh, I think we are talking about Germany, for example. Uh, and also there are big variations in encoding styles. Uh, and we already discussed that uh, today, earlier today. Uh, and then there's also caution needed when you work with the big data sets. Um, you need to set apart an enormous amount of time to prepare your data. We already saw in the presentation of Sandra Tuppen that she, she did actually the, the same uh, thing we did when preparing the geographical data and standardizing it, normalizing it. Um, and well, most data scientists need 80% of their time, of their product time, to prepare their data. And then they have 20% of their time to make nice visual maps and so on. Uh, and then to finish, uh, do not take the data at face value because of all the different encoding styles, because of all the different goals of why you are all uh, uh, assembling the data. And also, uh, yesterday I came to realize that for the different instruments, if you um, and you uh, decide to see them as compositions, a part of a composition, uh, it's underlying there, there's actually a different data model. So, and, and it's fitted into the RISM data model and model of the musical world. So you, you need to think about that before using the data. And then I promised you an invitation. If you think, the, uh, if you want a closer peek uh, at the visualizations, please don't hesitate to visit Franz and me after this presentation and you can have a look at the interactive maps. Thank you.